Um, last time on your Red Puzzle, those of you that have done it, um, you should have talked about civil liberties that are protected by the Bill of Rights, things that the government cannot arbitrarily infringe upon. There are ways in which, there are circumstances in which the government can violate your Bill of Rights. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but they cannot do so arbitrarily. Anything that is protected by a Bill of Rights cannot be infringed upon arbitrarily. Today, we're going to talk about the First Amendment, particularly religion, the speech, and press freedoms. Um, we're going to start out with freedom of religion. You should know that freedom of religion has two pillars. According to the First Amendment of the Constitution, government shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. From that, we get two clauses that are very important when it comes to freedom of religion. From now on, whenever you see these two clauses, always think religion. Always think religion. Because they're going to try to trick you on your AP exam with your multiple choice about clauses in the Constitution. These pertain specifically to religion. The establishment clause of the U.S. Constitution creates a separation between church and state. The government cannot establish a national religion, which means it cannot make policies that would promote one religion over another religion. So that is the establishment clause. It creates a wall of separation between religion and government. There exists a wall, and that wall is the establishment clause. Then you get the free exercise clause, a less controversial one. The free exercise clause prohibits the government from making any policies that would prohibit somebody from practicing religion or practicing their beliefs. Again, belief in itself, a lot of you have a superficial understanding of freedom of religion. Freedom of religion doesn't protect your ability to believe because that's something that doesn't need to be protected right now. You can, do, you can think whatever you want for, for the most part. Right now, some of you can be thinking about sex and there's nothing I can do about it. The free exercise clause, what it does, the important thing that it does, is it protects the practice of those beliefs. However, and this is a theme for the rest of the week, these freedoms are not absolute. There are circumstances in which the government can limit and infringe upon these freedoms, including your free exercise clause, there are religious practices today that are not protected by the First Amendment. For example, these are some on the list. These are not protected by the First Amendment. Uh, even though they are part of some religious practices, these religious practices are not uh, protected by the Free Exercise Clause. Like, for example, there are some religions, including Islam, for example, that believes a, a man can marry multiple women, uh, which is called polygamy. That's something that is not protected by the First Amendment. You cannot marry multiple people legally in the United States yet. This became an issue when Mormons tried to do it um, in the 1800s. But legally, you are not allowed to have multiple people um, as your spouse. Um, drug use, this was a big topic back then. Uh, there's some Native American religions, for example, that require the use of hallucinogens that are banned in some states. Again. Those religious practices will not be protected by the First Amendment. Animal sacrifices also decided upon by the Supreme Court. There are some, like for example, Judaism a long time ago required animal sacrifices. That's not protected by the First Amendment. So these are banned by law. Again, your, relig your religious freedoms are not absolute. If there's a good reason to infringe upon these freedoms, then the Supreme Court will allow that infringement. And any questions? Both the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause are now incorporated to the state and local governments. On your Ed Puzzle, you guys talked about one of the most important concepts for Unit 3, which is Selective Incorporation. Or, the Bill of Rights only applied to the federal government, but something happened in the 1800s that applied the Bill of Rights to the states, one by one, what allows for Selective Incorporation. 14th Amendment. Very good. The 14th Amendment specifically, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment applies the provisions of the Bill of Rights one by one to the state and local governments. Today, almost every liberty found in the Bill of Rights are applied or incorporated to the state and local government. There are some that are not, like the Third Amendment and the Seventh Amendment are still not incorporated yet, 
but most of the freedoms and liberties are also applied to the state and local governments today. They also have to recognize that thanks to the 14th Amendment due process clause. Make sure you remember this. This is one of the most important things in Unit 3. All right. There is a conflict today, especially in regards to the Establishment Clause. The Free Exercise Clause, for the most part, banning some certain religious practices um, is not very controversial in the United States. The Establishment Clause is, though. We do have a dominant religious majority here in this country. Most of the people that live here, about 70% of Americans, would consider themselves Christians or some form of Christian. Um, and there are things that they want government to be able to do that would support Christianity that the Establishment Clause will probably not allow. So there's a lot of gray areas about this. Uh, for example, uh, there are religious signs in public buildings. Is that a violation of the Establishment Clause? We have religious um, symbology and we have religious things in our Pledge of Allegiance, in our money right now. Is that a violation of the Establishment Clause? So there's a lot of gray areas when it comes to um, the separation between church and state. This, when I was growing up, I grew up very religious. I was a Baptist when I was growing up. And in the pulpit, our pastors always talked about how they're taking away religion from, um, from schools. And one of the things that they preached against was the fact that today, we do not have prayer in public schools. Now, I'm not religious anymore, and I can see the other side now. Uh, so we'll talk about this first. But before we proceed today, things that you need to think about. For the most part, your civil liberties are protected from any government limitation or for every government infringement. But like I told you, they are not absolute. The default should be freedom. The default should be let people do whatever they want. Not allow government to infringe upon your rights, upon your liberties. That's a default. However, if there is a good reason to do so, and in the United States, who decides if that reason is good enough for the government to step in and restrict and limit these freedoms? The Supreme Court does, if there's a good reason. So the default should be freedom unless there's a good reason to infringe upon those freedoms. So again, this is a constant debate in the United States because the reasons that somebody might, com be, might find compelling, might find convincing, may not be convincing to you. In these cases that we're about to talk about, the reasons that the Supreme Court may have allowed the government to step in and infringe upon these freedoms may not be convincing reasons to you. This is a constant debate, like for example, with the mask. Should government be able to mandate mask wearing? Is there a good enough reason? Some people say yes and some people say no. It's a constant debate. Our first case today, again, Unit 3, is where we're, we're going to talk about most of the 15 required cases in AP government. We talked about five, I think. McCulloch, U.S. versus Lopez, there are redistricting cases, Baker versus Carr, Shaw versus Reno, and then Marbury versus Madison. Nine of them are in this unit. You need to know the facts of the case, at least be able to explain what went on in the case. You need to know what the constitutional questions and the clauses that are involved. You need to know why the Supreme Court decided the way that they did. Engel versus Vitale puts one thing on trial. Public school prayers. Public school prayers. Before Engel versus, oh, by the way, guys, remember why we're talking about these cases. We're not talking about these cases because of their immediate impact at that moment in history. That's not why they're important. They're important because they establish a what? What do all these cases that we're talking about establish? Precedence. Precedence. They establish precedence. Precedence that future cases that are similar will follow. That's why they're important. Angle versus Vitale is about public school prayer. School being a part of government, being a part of the state. Before Engel versus Vitale, the Supreme Court already said that schools cannot mandate a prayer. They used to do that, but the Supreme Court has already said, even before this case, that public schools are not allowed to mandate prayer because that would be government promoting Christianity, and that is against which clause of the U.S. Constitution? The Establishment Clause. The separation between church and state. Very good. Any questions about this? 
but this one is unique. The state of New York decided, you know what, we're going to do public school prayer, but we're going to do it in a way that we feel doesn't violate the Establishment Clause. So here's what they do. They do two things. Number one, every morning in New York public schools, the teacher will lead the students into prayer. The difference is, number one, it's going to be voluntary. If a student does not want to pray along, he or she does not have to. They can sit quiet or they can even step outside if they'd like. Number two, this prayer will be non-denominational. Most of the prayers in the past that public schools try to establish were very much for Christianity. So what New York is trying to do is they're trying to make it neutral. So this is the prayer. This is exactly the prayer that public school teachers in New York had to lead their students with. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee and, and, and beg thy blessings upon us, our teachers in our country. What you notice there is, it's a, a general God. It doesn't say Allah, it doesn't say Jesus, it doesn't say Buddha, it doesn't call on a specific God. That's what non-denominational means. So, when you're explaining the case, very easy. New York tried to establish public school prayer. His teachers lead their schools in, in, into a prayer. It's voluntary and it's non-denominational. Again, parents, especially non-religious parents, and non-Christian parents complain about this, that this is a violation of the Establishment Clause, so we get a court case, Angle versus Vitality. Here's the question the Supreme Court is trying to answer. If a school prayer, if a school-sponsored and promoted prayer that are voluntary and non that is, is, if it is voluntary and non-denominational, it is it still a violation of the Establishment Clause? What's the answer to this, guys? You know the answer to this because you grew up in public schools. Is it a violation? Yes. Do we have public school prayers today? No. no, we don't. Texas is a very religious state. If we can get away with it, we would have public school prayers. But because of this case, because of what the Supreme Court decided in this case, we don't have it. Because they believed, in, in this case, that even non-denominational and voluntary prayers are still a violation of the Establishment Clause. So the whole thing is yes. This is exactly what they put on their decision. They believe that government has no business composing prayers. It's still government promoting religion. As long as it is a state or school sponsored prayer, promoted prayer, a violation of the Establishment Clause because it's still the government promoting religion and according to the Supreme Court, the government should have no business doing that, should have no business composing prayers at all. So they believe that the New York government was promoting religion, which is a violation of the Establishment Clause. This goes beyond this, guys. Um, using this precedent, um, future cases about prayers in schools will be decided upon, um, like for example, what about if the prayer was student-led? What if I wasn't the one leading you guys to a prayer? What if I asked for a volunteer? Maybe I asked for Mia to come up here and lead you guys to a prayer, constitutional or unconstitutional? Can I do that? No, I cannot. If, even if it's student-led, I cannot do that because it's still school-sponsored. It's still school-promoted prayer. I allowed for that platform. I gave her that platform. So I always like to give this example. So obviously because of this case, if Ms. Kaufman goes on an intercom and starts leading you guys to a prayer, obviously that's unconstitutional. But if Jane was the one to do it during second period, is it, is it, is it that unconstitutional? Yes. yes, that would be unconstitutional because that would be the, still the school promoting prayer. They allowed her that platform, they gave her access to the intercom, so that would still be a violation of the establishment clause. So then does the FCA club violate the establishment clause? The Supreme Court, according to a decision, um, they decided that religious clubs do not violate the establishment clause because they're not curricular, you don't need them to graduate, they happen before or after school. So they're not a violation of the establishment clause. Um, something that does violate the Establishment Clause is if your coach leads you 
to a prayer before a football game or before a game, that's a violation of the establishment clause. Uh, even if your coach didn't lead the prayer, if he decides to participate in it, that would still be a violation of the establishment clause. Now, it's not enforced all the time in the United States because, for the most part, no one really cares, but it is a violation of the establishment clause according to precedents in the past. So if your coaches are doing that, they are violating your civil liberties. I don't want to know, but we'll let you know. Any questions? As a reminder, you can still pray in, in private. Private student prayer is not a violation of the Establishment Clause. You praying by yourself does not violate this decision. This is school-sponsored, school-promoted, state government-promoted prayer is not allowed in violation of the Establishment Clause. But a student by himself praying? Okay. If you, as students, as the members of the football team, you want to get into a huddle and you want to pray by yourselves, that's fine, as long as your coach is not involved, because your coach represents the government, and government cannot promote religion, in, especially in school activities like a football game. Any questions regarding this? So it banned public school prayer, and it favored civil liberties over the interests of the majority. The majority of the United States wanted school prayer, but again, guys, you need to remember the Bill of Rights is not really for the majority. The Bill of Rights is put into our Constitution to protect minority rights, to protect the atheists, to protect the Muslims that are, are in our public schools. It favored um, civil liberties, in this case freedom of religion, over majority interests. Alright, next. Wisconsin versus Yoder, 1972. This is, by the way, this is a case that if your U.S. history teachers um, paid attention correctly, they should have gone over last year. Under Wisconsin law, like in almost all the states in the United States, it is mandatory for you to attend school, especially public school, until the age of 16. There's a mandatory public school enrollment until the age of 16. Is that for Wisconsin law? Yes. So under Wisconsin law, it is mandatory for students to attend school until the age of 16. Amish that live in, ten, in Wisconsin, Amish are religious groups, they're very anti-technology, they pretty much do raise their kids like they're, they raise them in the past. Very religious, very conservative. Amish families did not want their kids to attend public schools past the eighth grade. They did not want to let their kids attend public schools past the eighth grade. They believed that high school education conflicted with their values and their beliefs, their religious values and their religious beliefs, and the way that they would want to raise their kids. So again, Amish families, they believe that high school education, going past the eighth grade, high school public education, conflicted with their religious values and beliefs, the way that they want to raise their kids under their religious beliefs. State of Wisconsin said there is a good. Re oh, by the way, before we move on, which clause of the First Amendment are we talking about? Um, exercise. This is a free exercise clause. Very good. This is a free, this is a free exercise clause case. So, so Amish families are accusing the state of Wisconsin of infringing upon their right to raise their kids according to their religion, according to their religious values, that they're infringing upon their religious practice. So this is a, this is a free exercise clause case. So why are they doing it? Because they believe that this is an infringement upon, is a violation of their right to raise their kids according to their religious values, which they believe is against the free exercise clause. 
However, remember, your freedom of religion, and like all your other civil liberties, are not absolute. If there's a good reason, then they can be infringed upon. And according to the state of Wisconsin, they have a good reason. An educated population is good for society. If the population is more educated, that would mean the state of Wisconsin would prosper. It would be a better society with an educated population. And if we allow the Amish not to send their kids past the eighth grade, that would mean society in Wisconsin will um, be lowered because of it, or will be worse because of it. So there's an interest in an educated population that would lead to a better state, a better government, a better um, society. The question is, this, did Wisconsin violate the free exercise clause? Did it threaten the Amish's um, civil liberties? Their right to raise their kids according to their religion? Here's what the Supreme Court said. Supreme Court said yes, yes. Here's what. It's not that the Supreme Court disagreed with Wisconsin's reasoning. They believe, yeah, a, a good society is a good reason to violate civil liberties, having a good society. However, Wisconsin did not provide enough evidence that would suggest that those extra two years of education, because remember, we're talking about between eighth grade and 16 years old, so that's only two years. The state of Wisconsin did not provide evidence that those two years will matter. That two years of public education, those extra two years, will actually have this significant benefit. Why is that? Because even before the law, Amish people pay their taxes, they're good citizens. There's no evidence that those extra two years will have a significant impact on society that not having those extra two years will have a significant impact, will have a significant negative impact on society. They even reason, you know what, Amish citizens, they've been good citizens even before the law was passed. So there's no reason why we should compel them to go those extra two years. Yes, ma'am. So we would put despite of missing two years, or? Yes, despite not having those two years of education. So again, the theme here is, guys, the Supreme Court has to find your reason to, for government to limit freedoms, compelling it. They have to find it significant enough to allow government to restrict freedom. And in this case, and in the case in Engel versus Vitali, they did not find the state's reasoning to be compelling enough, to be good enough. So again, the court prioritized civil liberties over state interests. The court prioritized civil liberties over state interests. Let's move on to freedom of speech. When it comes to freedom of speech, guys, there's a constant conflict between our right to express ourselves however they want, however we want, protected by the First Amendment, and public safety and social order. There are a lot of times that expression can lead to danger and can lead to societal disorder. And these are what these topics or these themes is what we're going to be exploring in the next two cases. Next. Tinker versus Des Moines. Tinker versus Des Moines, look at the date. Anybody know what's happening then? Civil rights movement. Civil rights movement will be one. What else? Vietnam War. Vietnam, very good. Um, two siblings, Major Mary and John, um, Tinker siblings, decided to protest the Vietnam War by wearing black armbands to school. Anybody know what those, what that symbol represents? Peace. It's associated with hippies, associated with um, um, the peace movement in the United States. So they decided to, this is all you need to know, they decided to protest the Vietnam War in school by wearing black armbands. The school did not like 
the way they're protesting. And they thought they interfered with education, which is what they're trying to accomplish in public schools. So they told the siblings, don't wear this anymore. We're going to suspend you if you do. Next day, they do it anyway. And they get suspended. The Jaker siblings, they protest, and they said this is a violation of their civil liberties, particularly which freedom? Freedom of speech, freedom of expression. This case is important to us because of two things. Number one, this is a unique kind of speech. This isn't verbal. They're not writing anything down. They're not saying anything. This is symbolic speech, symbolic, particularly symbolic political speech. Is that protected by the person? We don't know. So, first on trial here is symbolic speech. Is that protected by the First Amendment? What do, what do I mean by symbolic speech? Speech that is non-verbal. They're, they didn't say anything, they didn't write anything down, it's a non-verbal form of speech. And probably the most important one, and this is what I want you to put a star on it, is, is student speech protected by the First Amendment? Is student speech protected by the First Amendment? When you stepped into campus today, did you lose your First Amendment rights to freedom of speech? So that's another thing on trial in Tinker versus Demo. Anyone have any questions so far? So these are the two questions the Supreme Court will attempt to answer. Number one, they said, yes, symbolic speech is protected by the First Amendment. Symbolic speech is protected by the First Amendment. And number two, probably the more important question of the two, student speech is still protected by the First Amendment in school. Student speech is still protected. However, guys, they didn't say it's completely protected. They did not say that it's absolutely protected. They said, hey, if there's enough evidence to suggest that somebody's speech is interfering with school activities, it's interfering with the school's goal of educating students, then yes, the school can infringe upon students' First Amendment rights. However, in this case, there's no evidence that it did that. There's no evidence that them wearing those black armbands significantly disrupted school activities or school organization. So again, they didn't say it's absolutely protected. They said in this case, in Tinker versus Des Moines, the school failed to provide enough evidence to suggest that the student's speech significantly, that's the word that you're always, always going to have to remember, the significantly interfered or disrupted school activity. So absent evidence that student speech um, disrupted or conflicted with school discipline or organization, no limitations on, schools, on student speech can be imposed. So, in fact, symbolic speech is protected by the First Amendment, according to the Supreme Court. Number two, First Amendment rights of students in school is defined by the school. Is defined by the school. However, in this case, the Supreme Court prioritized freedom of speech over the school's interests. Green Corps prioritize real speech over the school's interest. All right, guys, let's use this precedent over some scenarios. Let's say tomorrow, Marva walks in to my classroom, is wearing a pro-Trump t-shirt. Protected or unprotected? That's protected. Using this precedent, did that interfere significantly with school operations? No, it didn't. Make sense so far? What if he goes into school and he's wearing a t-shirt and it says, F Trump? Would that be protected? Yes. And it's on a t-shirt? Yes. Would that be protected speech? Is that the school's well, discretion? Well, it doesn't say F, it says the actual word. Oh, it's at the school's discretion. Is it uh, older? Like, the question you need to ask is, would that significantly interfere with school operations, with school activities? 
the Florida the Supreme Court, you may disagree, but the Florida Supreme Court, that does significantly interfere, like bad words like that, drugs, that significantly interferes with school operations, so that's not protected by the First Amendment. Does that make sense? Again, the reasons you may agree with or you may not agree with, but I'm telling you precedents in the past. Any questions regarding this, guys? So political speech, symbolic speech, as long as they do not significantly disrupt school operations, protected by the First Amendment. That's why we have like a dress code, guys, because the, Supreme, the, the school is saying that certain clothing or articles of clothing, that certain outfits interfere with student or with school operations. Whether or not you agree with that or not, that's up to you. Next. Yes, ma'am. Sorry? Uh, school's interest. All right. Again, like all your freedoms, you know, speech is not guaranteed. There are some cases where government will be allowed to restrict, will be allowed to limit. So freedom of speech is not guaranteed. Like in our next case, Schenck versus United States. Look at the date, what's happening? This is at the end of World War I. During World War I, in case you don't remember, the United States government instituted a military draft, which a lot of people did not agree with, but we did have a draft. A man named Schenck and a partner that he had started passing out flyers that told people to resist the draft, to not register for the draft. Because he disagreed with the military draft, he started passing out flyers that compelled people or that talked about resisting the draft. However, there was a law called the Espionage Act that forbid people from interfering with military recruitment. So the Espionage Act forbid people from interfering with military recruitment. What Shank did is basically directly violating that law. It violated the Espionage Act. I'm sorry, it forbid what? So again, Espionage Act forbid interfering with military recruitment. Again, at the time of war, so the U.S. government wanted military recruitment to go smoothly, so they passed a law, a U.S. law, that forbid people from interfering with military recruitment. Schenck did exactly that by passing out flyers and told people to resist the draft. He gets arrested, and he says the Espionage Act is a First Amendment violation. They are infringing upon my right to express myself, my political views. But we get one of the most important cases when it comes to freedom of speech, Czech v. United States. All right. The question is, were Schenck's actions protected by freedom of speech? So they're protected by the freedom of speech clause of the First Amendment. So in this case, there's two things in conflict. Schenck's freedom of speech and the government's interest to preserve national security. Again, this is a time of war, and any interfering with military recruitment may cause us to lose the war or may cause us to lose more lives in World War I. That's why they passed that law in the first place. Is that a good enough reason to restrict Schenck's freedom of speech rights? So the question is, were Schenck's actions protected by freedom of speech? The Supreme Court said no. They were going to establish one of the most important precedents when it comes to freedom of speech in U.S. history. They said speech that presents clear and present danger. This is called the clear and present danger doctrine. Speech that presents clear present danger. Clear and present danger is not protected by the First Amendment. It's not protected by the First Amendment. If expression or speech presents a clear and present danger, according to the Supreme Court in Schenck versus the United States, it is not protected by the First. You said it's a doctrine? It's called the Clear and Present Danger Doctrine. That's what the precedents call it. Any expression or speech that may present clear and present danger is not protected by the First Amendment. Question, how do we know if it presents clear and present danger? The Supreme Court said context matters. When they're evaluating whether or not speech presents clear and present danger, 
and whether or not they're going to allow government to restrict that speech, they will evaluate the context in which that speech is made. They said, in any other time, what Shank did may, may have been protected by the First Amendment. In any other time, it may have been protected by the First Amendment. However, what's going on at the time? War was going on at the time. National security is of the utmost importance for the government. And his speech was potentially dangerous. Um, they provided a, the example that some of you may know of in their opinion in Shank versus the United States. They compared Shank's actions to yelling fire at a crowded building like at a theater. It may cause clear and present danger. And if that's the case, that speech will not be protected by the First Amendment. Does that make sense? So to them, this is similar to you going at an airport and yelling bomb. That presents a clear and present danger, and it will not be protected by the First. Directly inciting violence, like fighting words. This is in your test. Fighting words violates this precedent. Like if I say, I'm going to stab you. That's clear and present danger that will not be protected by the First Amendment. So threatening someone, what the Supreme Court called fighting words, not protected by the First. Because it will present a clear and present danger. All right, guys. Let's see. So clear and present danger doctrine. It established that president. The court prioritized the government's interest in national security over freedom of speech. The court prioritized the government's interest in national security over freedom of speech in here. And you're going to see national security is very important for the Supreme Court. And if the reason is national security, a lot of times, the, U, the Supreme Court will side with the government and will infringe on civil liberties. This is one of those cases. I'm sorry? Uh, the court prioritizes national security, the government's interest in national security over freedom of speech in this case, over civil liberties. Sorry? Yes. There's still a, they already examined that in the Supreme Court and they said it's not a violation of the First Amendment. I'm sorry, off the, off the Bill of Rights. All right, guys, I'm sorry we're not going to be able to take your quiz today. I know some of you did take notes. We're going to take them tomorrow. It's going to be over Lesson 1 and Lesson 2. So what we talked about today and what we talked about in the Ed Puzzle, if you did not do your Ed Puzzle yet, you got your chance. I have to subtract points, but still have a chance to study so that we can do it tomorrow. So your only homework assignment that's due tomorrow is study lesson one and lesson two. Take notes, take notes on those, and I'll, I'll allow you to use them on your quiz tomorrow. Guys, look at the board so you know what's coming up. Um, for unit three, the homework assignments I'm going to be assigning you all are SCOTUS comparison questions. Some of you right now are struggling with your grade, so I'm going to make this a test grade. The good thing about making this a test grade is like all of your homework assignments, what can you do with it? You can correct it. So you can get your 100 as long as you're constantly correcting it. So make sure that you're doing so, guys. Um, I provided uh, instructions how to do it, and then I provided your first course comparison question. This is 50% of a test grade. If you get your 100 by Wednesday, yeah, I'll give you a 10 point bulb on a test grade. Make sense so far? This is due not tomorrow morning, it's going to be due the next morning. But I suggest you start on it today, I'll try to correct it tomorrow morning, and that will give you more chances to get 100 by Wednesday. Any questions? Wait, sir, is it like watching a video or is there a No, well you watch the video first so that you know how to, how to do it. It's basically one of your, uh, you have four FR teams, this is one of them on your AP government exam. So what SCOTUS comparison is, is you're going to take a case that we've talked about and they're going to give you a case that you haven't seen before and you need to compare the two cases. Any 
You want to have any questions? Exactly. Try to find what's similar or what's different about the two pieces. Any questions so far? Over here, guys, is what we just talked about today. It's an Ed puzzle about what we just talked about today. I know some of you need quiz points. Um, go ahead and do it. It's 100 quiz points if you do it. All these optional stuff, guys, I'm only going to count until after, <coughs> until before the exam. If you do it after the exam, then there's no point because you're not learning anything for the exam. So make sure if you're going to do the optional, uh, optional assignment, make sure you're doing it before the exam for unit three. All right, we'll continue tomorrow.
just let me know. So if your name's on this list, you owe me something, make sure you come by. I'll be here after school until 5.20.
Oh, you have a from last time. Oh, you're not. Some of most of you haven't turned it in yet. 